guests today are Bill and Joyce Harley, and if it's the first time that you've met them, we had them on yesterday's program, and it was fabulous. It really was. Uh, Bill, Joyce, thank you for coming and being with us on It's a New Great Day. Great to be with you. We're making an investment and a deposit into marriages this week, and I'm so glad that you're here. You know, just giving of yourselves and your time, uh, the expertise, but then the, you know, just really the gift of God to help relationships and marriages thrive. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we're featuring a book, His Needs, Her Needs. Uh, over three million copies sold. It outsells itself year after year after year. Wonderful. Came out back in 1986. I was just in uh, the control room here, just behind this wall behind me. And uh, I, I talked to the director and producer, you know, and that kind of thing. Great shows, you know. And uh, my producer, she says, it's the best marriage book I've ever read. Oh, that's great. You know? And uh, she says, and it's as old as I am. <laughs> so she's young, newly married, you know, loves her marriage, loves her husband, you know, the wonderful couple. And yet, you know, this is, you know, bringing real answers and solutions to their marriages as well. So uh, yesterday we talked about men and their needs. And today we're going to talk about women and her needs. Aren't you glad you're with us? <laughs> <laughs> so who's going to lead this? Joyce, will it be you? Bill's going to lead, and then I will add. Yes, oh, okay. he's the author. He's okay. the authority. So you're going to make sure he gets the your needs so right. You know what they oh, are. I have lots to say. There's no <laughs> doubt about it about this. So I'll get in there. But why don't you list them? Well, first of all, we have to start out for any listeners that didn't hear yesterday's yeah. show that, that I start out with uh, telling couples, what can you do? that will make each other the happiest. And um, because I've, I've, I've studied this in the past, I'm able to give them a list of choices. They can add to the choices if they want, but I want them to pick five out of the list because I don't want to overwhelm their spouse mm -hmm. with too many things to do. Right. Uh, yeah, so you want to do the things that are going to make the most difference, yes. that are going to deposit the most love units. Right. And if if you have one that's not on the list and it's a priority, you know, to you, yep. you're saying put right. it on. Put it Absolutely. on the list. Okay. If, it me, if it's going to make you These happy. These are suggestions, okay. ideas. Yeah. And really what typically people did come up with. Yes. You know, so there are people out there that help make this list. Yes. And re real quick, let me just review what the what the whole list is. All right, let's do that. It's 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 again, if I can remember it I correctly. <coughs> Affection. Yep. Sexual fulfillment, mm -hmm. conversation, recreational companionship, uh, honesty and openness, physical attractiveness, uh, uh, financial support, domestic support, family commitment, and admiration. You did it. Is that right? Did I miss anything? No. Okay. <laughs> you so, got it even in order. Yeah, did he really? Last time yeah. I didn't do it in order. <laughs> so the basic idea is, out of that list, what could your spouse do for you that would make you the happiest? And last week, last yesterday, we said that for men, they choose sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, physical attractiveness, uh, admiration, and domestic support. Women, on the other hand, have a different list of five, and this was an amazing, an interesting thing to me because I thought that there'd be some crossover. Well, there is for, for for a particular couple, there might be a lot of crossover, but on average, on average, there is no crossover. In other words, what men need in marriage is very different than what women need. So today we'll talk about what women need, mm -hmm. and usually what women will come up with is a first and second that are tied. <laughs> They're, they're together, and so w I won't talk of one being more important than the other because they're both important. But the, 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 the first that I list in my book is, ad is, is affection. And uh, affection is a symbol of care, a symbol of care. Okay, when you, when now, let's, I just want to jump in here real quick yeah. as you go through because for men it, it was se sexual, Fulfillment, right. okay, yep. mm -hmm. and for women, you're saying typically number one is affection and care. Yeah, and okay. but, but one and two are tied. So when we get to two, I don't want to make one oh, more okay. important than but the what, other. But what I want to really help <clears throat> men with here to to make a mm -hmm. difference, it's different than sexual fulfillment. And very different. Affection is not sex. It's, exactly. It's mm -hmm. what you would do for your children. 
Okay. It, it's, it's when you hug your child, you are telling your child you'll be there for them when they need you, you care about them, you want them to be happy, you'll do what it takes to make them fulfilled. So <clears throat> when you hug your wife, uh, you, you are communicating to her that you, are, you care about her. You care about the problems she faces. You'll be there for her when, when she needs you. You provide security through affection. And I talk about the environment of affection. In other words, affection is not an act. Affection is an environment. So affection is exhibited throughout the day. So in, in your communication, you tell your spouse that you love her. You, you hug her in the morning when, you, when, when, when you're in bed. You hug her when you go off to work. You, you let her know when you're going to come home from work as an act of care. So she feels cared for by your expression of affection in and of itself. Now, it's important to understand that affection isn't actually caring for her. Affection is just the promise of care. It's saying, I will be there for you when you need me. Now, there's an argument that could be made that if you are affectionate in your acts, but not affectionate in your deeds, then the affection doesn't mean anything. Right. So if mm -hmm. you give your spouse a card saying how much I care about you, but then your actions are not caring, the card doesn't mean anything. So there's a sense in which affection has to be backed up by actual, actual care. Okay. The next is conversation. And like I say, the two go hand in hand. And, and I talk about intimate conversation as being important in marriage for women. And that is conversation about your personal feelings, about the problems you face, about your plans for the future, um, things that are personal that you talk to your spouse about, deposit massive numbers of love units for a woman. Now, that's one of the reasons that a woman can have an affair with a man who simply talks to her. So somebody at work who is interested in the problems that she faces and simply talks to her about her personal problems, he can deposit so many love units that she ends up falling in love with him. So, you, so the, the thing that you have to understand about affection and conversation, is, and, and this is something I make a point of in, in His Needs, Her Needs, is that they should be off limits to everyone except your spouse. So as a husband, you need to be a great conversationalist. You have to be very affectionate. And there isn't another man in her life that should be able to do either one of those things. I just want to add here yeah. regarding the, uh, the conversation. <clears throat> yes. On the radio show, we got a call from a woman who was very upset, and rightfully so. She said, first, I'm a Christian, and second, I love my husband. But third, I'm also in love with somebody at work. What do I do? Well, of course, you know what we would say, you know, cease and desist. You know, it's your husband that's going to be the center of your life, not this man at work. But how did it happen? Well, he talked to me. Mm -hmm. He listened. He was concerned. He cared about what I was going through. So right away, I mean, the, the, why I even share this is that never allow, and I'm going to just reiterate what Bill said, yes. but it's so insidious in our churches, workplace, even in family, relatives getting together, we can find ourselves being drawn to somebody that converses with us and listens with us. Psychology Today, oh, May issue two years ago, I believe. They ranked emotional infidelity on par with physical infidelity. So if somebody's sitting out there and they say, well, I'm not having an affair, right, right. emotionally, you can be having an affair and it's robbing from the relationship you should be having with your mate, with your spouse. So I go back to the conversation. Bill and I talk a lot. I am fortunate. Bill is a conversationalist. <laughs> but that being said... Has set, that been natural for you, Bill? Yeah. Or has um, this been something you've developed? To be honest with you, being a psychologist has made it a lot easier for okay. me. Yeah. Okay. Because while, when I was an engineer, <laughs> it wasn't nearly as conversational. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I didn't but, have the vocabulary that I needed. Yes. But it, it's something any man can learn to do is Good. the thing. 
And and this is this is the important thing about uh, about training is that you can become very affectionate. You be, can become an intimate conversationalist if you aren't one already. But to learn how to do it, the environment is very important. Even with Bill's expertise in listening and conversing, I find he is the best conversationalist in the car. <laughs> <laughs> we've, we've talked about this. Where there are few That's distractions, yeah. I have them to myself. And why do I share this? Because, I mean, there are environments that are going to be more conducive to getting this to happen. Yeah. And uh, affection would be the same way. Yeah. Yes. And oh, affection, may I go back to that, that is not just Valentine's Day, one day of the year. No, no. Valentine's Day should be one of the 364 other days that this affection is taking place. Okay. Uh, l let me ask you, Joyce, uh, because, y you know, this is important I'm for you. I'm a woman, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but these are, these are in your priority. Okay. So how does Bill, you know, show affection to you? A lot of hugs. Okay. A lot of... Um, we're not so much into the gift giving, and that's what, yeah. not what affection is. Um, but I guess what I'm saying, what does Bill do that causes you to feel safe? You know, Bill's you know, making these promises, okay. I'll be there for you, I'll right. support you, I'll defend you, I'll fight for you. How is that, you know, in his actions being lived out that you're like, yeah, that's my man? Interesting you ask that, because I think that conversation is an affectionate thing. Believe it or not, because that's where he expresses his care for me. Okay. By listening, giving me ideas, giving me input on what is dear to my heart at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, I think it's really through our times together alone that I feel the most affection and protected and being cared for. Okay. Do you ever feel as though, and I'm just going to nitpick here a little bit, do you ever feel though sometimes or come across cases where, you know, you, it's like, I, whenever I share an issue or a problem or a concern that I have, I feel like more, more I'm a, a project, you know, that he, my, my husband feels like he has to fix. Hmm. And I, really what I want to do is to be heard, you know, and, I, and, and mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't want him to fix me all the time. I just want to talk. Does that happen? I might be a little unique in the woman end of things because I'm often, often looking for a solution. Okay. So, but Bill is not, in this case, he is not always giving me a solution. I will share what's happening and I'll ask, what do you think of that? Okay. What would your reaction have been? Where do you think I should go with this? He'll give me input. I'll make the final decision. Mm -hmm. But the point is that we are conversing on the issue and no, in our relationship, I don't feel as if he's trying to stop talking, let's just solve the problem and let's watch the football game type yeah, of a thing. Yeah, no, he's yeah. not that way. Okay. And that would be the wrong way to handle it. Because I think I represent women in the fact that we want to explore together and we want your input. And maybe we will come to you and say, how would you fix it? Yeah. Because I'm a oh, little, they love to fix. I'm emotional about this, and you're a little bit more clinical yeah. at, about it, perhaps, and you can give me a perspective that I don't have. Bill and I often say that in marriage, you bring together two ways of thinking. Our brains are different, it's just the way we're made, and our perspectives then are different. And together, we make a better whole yeah. because of our perspectives. Good. Yeah, again, being a psychologist is a help here because one of the things I know about people is that they don't want advice unless they ask for it. And this is true of your spouse as well. But everybody can learn that. <clears throat> yeah, you can yeah. all you can learn. We're all learning not here. To get right. it. And that, I guess that's yeah. the whole thing is <clears throat> right. let's learn this. You don't, know, yeah. I have to change and you will as well, but we're going to grow together. Yeah. We're going to learn these because why we're going to enjoy life. But together. one of the things that yeah. is important that I tell <clears throat> couples is that as a psychologist and a counselor, I can get away with giving advice sometimes when a person doesn't specifically ask for it because I'm, a, I'm their psychologist. In marriage, you can never do that. In, in marriage, you wait for them to ask the question and, to then, invite it. and then you don't give them a psychologist's answer. You don't tell your spouse, for example, that they have an emotional problem that they need to have treated. And you don't tell them that they have a personality disorder 
and you don't tell them that they have issues that need to be somehow resolved. You don't yeah. do any of those things. Yeah. You basically uh, are looking at your spouse as someone who has a different perspective than you do, someone who has um, uh, insight into life that you don't see. I think of a man and a woman as back to back, each of them looking in opposite directions. And they are asking each other, what do you see? And just because they're seeing something entirely different than you doesn't mean they're not seeing reality. They're seeing a different side of reality than you are. So it's very, very important when a husband and wife are, are talking together and trying to help each other out. And when she says, what do you think about this? that you express your opinion as, as something that impresses you, but would not necessarily solve your spouse's problem. You let your spouse make that judgment. Come up with the conclusions yeah. themselves. Yes. Again, being a psychologist helps me in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're well, passing on that wisdom now. Well, I yes. understand, I understand. <laughs> you lead into the meaningful, I think. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of catching up on the day or maybe the week. It's been a busy time, perhaps, you know? Um, but you lead into the deeper after you get the facts out of the way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I want Bill to know, and I want to hear from him. Who did you hear from today? Who did you talk with? What did they say? What, what is the resolve of this? Yeah, and I'll tell you what I did. Yeah. And I mean, so, so there's factual gathering of mm -hmm, information mm -hmm. also. But it then leads to other more philosophical conversations, yep. perhaps, yeah, yeah. and theological yeah, conversations. Yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Right. I, I, it, it is. It, it just find it. You know, find those places and those moments and carve them into your day. It, it's not just going to happen. You got to create it. You know, those types of things. So, be intentional. Right. Okay. Good. So those are the top two. Right. Now let, let me make. Let me add one more thing, yes. and that is that. Uh, these two emotional needs are so important for women that if you end up being a very affectionate man and you end up being a great conversationalist, <clears throat> chances are that's all it'll take for her to be in love with you. Um, if the wife is a great sexual companion and enjoys the same recreational activities that he does, that'll deposit enough love units for him to be in love with her. There, there's an argument that could be made that those four emotional needs <clears throat> is all a couple needs to maintain their feeling of love. So what I have done is I have focused my attention on those four and I've said I want every couple I work with to schedule 15 hours a week to meet those four emotional needs. Sexual fulfillment, recreational companionship, affection, conversation and they do they should do all four of them on a date so they should have like four hours blocked out where they meet those four emotional needs and then another four hours blocked out where they meet those four emotional needs and another four hours blocked out where and and they do that throughout the week now a lot of times counselors talk about the importance of date night once yeah. a month that sort of thing that's not enough to sustain romantic love it's not enough I mean, if you were dating somebody and you only took her out once a month, chances are she'd never fall in love with you, you'd never fall in love with her. So this has to be done 15 hours a week with these four emotional needs in mind, and if you do those, you will end up being in love the rest of your life. Now, as, as it turns out, when I was trying to struggle with what it was that was keeping Joyce and I in love with each other, and, and I thought, you know, I, we're Christians, my commitment to the Lord, our, our uh, commitment to each other, um, the fact that I, 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 I was willing to sacrifice for her, she was willing to sacrifice for me, we, were, uh, we, we believed in unconditional love, we, and, and it finally dawned on me that what it was, was that we dated each other. And I'm a workaholic, I, I was working 70 hours a week, but I spent 15 hours a week with Joyce alone where the two of us met each other's intimate emotional needs. I didn't spend a whole lot of time with my kids, but I spent a lot of time with Joyce. And as a result, we have had a consistent romantic relationship throughout our 47 years of life. And as it turns out, 
when I got other couples to do that, it saved their marriages. And so this is, these four emotional needs are a big deal in marriage, but you have to schedule time in order to do it. If you don't schedule time, it won't happen, you won't be in love. That's that. That's it. <laughs> That's Bottom that. Bottom line. There you go. Good. All right. Here, we do have we do have more needs, though. Do we? Yeah, <laughs> and, and we'll come back and we'll talk. I don't want to be that, shortchanged. But this is this is extremely significant. Uh, you know, very very important for people, and I think it's bringing some real answers to some questions that they've had, okay. and they're almost like, you mean that's it? And it's like, mm, pretty much, you know. And then the other thing is, guys are going, they're rolling their eyes, saying, Bill. 15 hours? Sounds like a Are lot of work. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. You know, really. Yep. And, uh, but no, it's going to be intentional. And uh, y you've been married 50, no, 40, 47, 47 years. years mm -hmm. right. 47 years. Are you happy? And we've been in love 47 years. See, yeah. that's the important thing to and understand. And a little bit before that, even, yeah. we don't, to get there, right? Yeah. You yeah. don't need to lose your love for each other. Yeah. You know, and if you lose your love, you can get it back. Yeah. See, that's the, that's the important thing. To Isn't that neat? It is. Yeah. There's hope. Very blessed. There's a lot of hope today. Wonderful. We're, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. His needs, her needs. There you go. Get the book. Available from us here at New Day Ministries, or you can go to marriagebuilders.com, which is their ministry there. Uh, a whole, as you can see on, on the table here, all kinds of books and resources. Uh, Bill has been just using uh, different words, and it's like, oh, yeah, you wrote that in that book, and you wrote that in that book. And so, I mean, there's resources uh, for you, if, if, if you find yourself as a young couple and uh, uh, you have young children in your marriage and, and you're trying to say, yeah, but 15 hours, I mean, I mean, the kids are siphoning every moment that we have. And, you know, what about it? Well, let me see. Let me go through here. And I'm going to find this. Um, and is, is, the, is this it? No. Nope. No. The, the okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> there we right, go. Come, we're going to find yeah, one it. One more. There, there we go. go. That is. Listen. No, nope, nope, that's not this, it. No, that, that, there it is. There it is. <laughs> his, ner his needs, her needs for parents. Right. So if you're, if you're like, okay, in this season of life, can't be done. what you're talking about can't be done. <laughs> and you're saying it can. Okay. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll be back with uh, Bill and Joyce right after this.